darkness. He actually says you're in the kingdom of darkness. Without him, you're wretched, poor, miserable, and blind. And without Jesus, and I don't know, I just hear this heart cry tonight of, of man, Jesus is coming back soon. And I know you've heard that phone to man, Jesus is coming back. And he's coming back for a holy bride. He is coming back for a holy bride. And it is important, family, that you begin to get all the junk out of your life, whatever it takes. Jesus was very radical when it came to removing sin from your life. He said, if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. Because it is better to enter into life maimed than it is to enter into eternal fire. Yeah. For your whole body to be cast into hell, the Bible says there will be weeping there and gnashing of teeth. And Jesus was radical, and he said, if you even have any anger against somebody, against your brother without a cause, he says, you are in danger of the judgment. Yeah. And he just deals with one thing after the heart. The whole time he's pursuing your heart and really in that, and in that. And when you see yourself as you are, and you see God for who he is and the divide that was there, you go, oh, no. Yeah, come on. But God sends his son, Jesus who bridged this gap and made a way for us to not just be forgiven, but to be changed, yeah, but to be transformed. And all of a sudden, it's like, it's like the activator to the love of God in your heart is I needed a savior and God sent his son yeah, come on. to be exactly what I needed. When I couldn't do it in myself, I couldn't do it. I, I, had, I didn't have the ability. The Bible says because of the weakness of my flesh, I couldn't fulfill the commands that I was called to fulfill. So God sent his son yes. in the likeness of sinful flesh that he would condemn sin in the flesh. That God in his son Jesus would reconcile the world, that's us, back to himself. It says it pleased him to do this. Jesus. That's, that's the gospel and it's good news. But it's, it's important that in your life we're not just flippant with grace and flippant with righteousness. And, and our love is holy. You know how you spell L-O-V-E? H-O-L-Y. That's good. Love is holy. Jesus says, if you love me, you will keep my commandments. Yes. And you do that by, by knowing he saved my life. That has to get so real in you. Do you know what belief really is? Belief is behavior. Belief is behavior. If you say you have faith, the Bible says this. If you say you have faith, but you do not have works, you do not have faith. He actually says your faith is dead. It's not alive. It's not an active faith. It's not a breathing faith. It's not a real faith. It's a dead faith. You might have a good confession. You might have a good thought, but you really don't have faith if you don't have the actions that's supporting what you say you believe. And we just have to be so careful in these last days that we just don't slip off into a river of greasy grace that's going to slide on. us into hell. Come on. You have to live holy, fam. You have to live holy. He's calling us to live holy. To live holy his. You know what it means to be holy? To be holy his. Yeah, come on. That's a good word. You say, you say no to everything else and yes to this one who gave you everything. That's what holiness is. It's not performance. You can't do it. That's the point of the gospel. That's, that's the point. He knows. So he gives us this helper, and he's a person. Sometimes when somebody's talking to you, some people go through hard stuff, man. There is hard things in life. Life is challenging. Life is hard. I get it. In this life, you will have trouble. My best friend Jesus said that. He wasn't kidding. Yeah, come on. Come on. He says, but be of good cheer. I've overcome the world. Yes, yes. And he takes himself and he places himself inside of you by the helper, the comforter, and he leads you and he guides you. So if you're struggling, just surrender more to the leading. Surrender more to the guiding. You can't strive it, you surrender it. You can't grit your teeth, you surrender it. God, I can't do it. That's, he's like, I know, that's why, that's why I came. <laughs> yeah, come on. He's like, that's the point. You can't do it, but I can. That's good. And so right now, just, just tonight, and, and I'm going to preach. I'm going to basically kind of take this service out behind the shed and just, just bury it. I know it. It's coming. And so right now, I'm just, I'm just giving you just some, just some Jesus before I step into what we step off into. 
And so, Jesus, we love you. Jesus, we honor you. We thank you for this opportunity to gather together, God. And, and God, I even just in my heart, I repent from all the times that I've just drugged myself in here and I haven't looked at you and, and, and rightly and just wanted to be with you corporately, God, and just, just getting by and just singing the songs. God, I repent in my heart for not taking advantage of pressing in to the invitations of God the Father when he's calling me deeper, God. I, I repent, God, for, for not saying yes to depths, to deep things of you, God. And I repent for my complacency and, and I repent, God, for ever looking at anything else, God. I, I repent of these things tonight, God, and, and I say yes to you, Jesus, and I say yes to your call, and I say yes to the cross, Lord, that, that Lord, I just thank you that tonight, right now, I just even hear you. I hear you saying, if you want to follow me, you will deny yourself daily and take up your cross. And so I just thank you that tonight in this room, we wouldn't just be Christians, we would be cross carriers, Lord. And I thank you, Father, that we would truly seek you with a whole heart, because the Bible says, then we will find you. So I thank you tonight, God, for purifying us, making us clean. I thank you for the word. I thank you for the worship, for your presence, God. God, I thank you, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Downpour worship. Would you guys give downpour worship? I know give God praise, but would you guys give them a hand? I'm so thankful for our worship team. My goodness, they're all so amazing. What I love so much about our worship team is they're, they're, they're a pure stream to drink from. There's a lot of things you listen to, um, and, and they have a lot of different motivations, but these folks and and the different ones that sing up here, they're, they just want to bring God glory. And I'm telling you, that seems to be more of a rarity as time goes on. And so thank you, Downpour Worship. It was really good to have Shaylee Jones up there. Thank you, God. Yes, what a testimony. Thank you, Lord. Tomorrow is National Day of Prayer. And so I'm going to come up here. Don't come up here super early because I won't be here. I'll probably still be at home. But you can come up here throughout the day. And I'm going to have the church unlocked and the lights on. And uh, you can come just pray any time of the day. And, and I'll come up here tomorrow evening and lock it up. But tomorrow's National Day of Prayer. Be praying for our nation. As you know, um, this is election year. <clears throat> I don't, did, did everybody know that? <laughs> everybody acted surprised. And so tonight, I'm gonna, that's what I'm going to talk to you about. I actually titled my sermon, To Vote or Not to Vote. So I believe it's important. And where this even started was, uh, let, me, let me just stop right here. Just, I, I did talk to Pastor Johnny. I want to honor him and Pastor Laura. There's obviously, when they're not here, there's like an unfillable hole that's right here. And we have the best pastors ever. But I asked him, I said, Pastor Johnny, this is what God has laid on my heart. Do I have your permission? Do I have your blessing to speak on this? I would never talk about something like this behind um, my senior pastor's pulpit without his permission. If I say amen. So I'm not up here on a, I'm not going to have a political propaganda. I'm not going to push a, a, a party. I'm not even going to say this or that. I'm, I'm going to give you biblical principles. I'm going to give you biblical principles of how you should vote, why you should vote, and is voting wrong or is it right? I'm just going to show you in scripture what it is. Did I do that? So don't check out on me because this is where this started. I've had, um, I mean, I wouldn't even call them my friends. Oh, man, that sounded harsh. I would say fellow pastors that I know, um, that my brothers in Christ. There we go. That sounded uh, greasy, Gracie. My brothers in Christ that say there should not be politics behind the pulpit. And at first, that sounds right. But how many of you know the first idea you get in your mind without thinking about it more is usually wrong? <laughs> Maybe that's just me. <laughs> If, if more men, I'm going to speak to men because I'm a man and I know how I think. If more men with the first, if we would just stop running with the first idea that just flew into our mind and immediately just jump into it, we'd save ourselves a lot of trouble. So at first it sounds right, but it just didn't set right in my old holy ghost, man. It did, and I thought, mm, I don't know, man. I don't know about that one. That one didn't quite sit right with me, man. And, and, but I keep hearing more and more preachers say about it. But here's the thing. I care more about your soul than I do your wallet. I, I, care, I care about you. I care about our, our kids and, and our nation. I care about the direction it's heading. I care about the generations. I care, man. And so I can't just, I can't just let people walk off a cliff kind of in utter blindness. Like you have to, that's not love. 
Like my, I have no motivation. Like if I, if I didn't do this again, I'm telling you, I would be okay. I don't have this, this gift that I've just burns in me. To, I, don't, I don't, I really don't. I have, what burns in me is to be with the one that I love. And his name's Jesus. I, that's what I burn for. And so tonight, that's what we're going to talk about. And so <clears throat> I want you to know, I, I, I haven't studied politics to any great degree. I'm not some political guru. I'm simply sharing my heart, my heart from the word of God. I've given myself to the word for 10 years of my life now, thoroughly given myself to the word for 10 years of my life now. I've, I've spent time with Jesus, and, and it's been God's grace that I've even been able to do that. I give him glory for it. It's just the Lord. And, and so I'm just going to talk to you from my heart, but... And so first, I, I want to talk about I, I want to talk about three different things. So how should I vote? Why should I vote? And is voting wrong or is it right? If you have your Bibles, I hope you do. Go to Joshua chapter five. Let's start in the Word of God. So first, the first thing we're going to tackle is how should I vote? How in the world should I vote in this crazy world we're living in? And I want you to know, um, gosh, I love Jesus so much. He's so good. But it's, you have to tread so carefully upon this thing. This is almost going to maybe sound more like a lecture at a psychology class probably than it will a sermon. <laughs> but I've, I've, I've come to learn just from being with people, just from reading the word of God, every single person, whether, whether you recognize it or not, you have, you have a way in your mind and in your heart that you deal with situations. You have a way that you've established in your life, whether you've recognized it or not, that you deal with loss or you deal with gain, whether you deal with victory or you deal with defeat, whether you're, how you deal with betrayal and tragedy and, and hard things. You have actually developed things in your mind and in your heart, whether you recognize it or not. They're, the psychologists would actually call it mental maps of reality or um, things like that. And so you have a way that you navigate through life in your heart and in your mind that you've made, whether you know it or not. And so talking about politics is really hard for people because sometimes um, it challenges the way people's made, the way they orchestrated life in their mind. It challenges that thinking. That's what the gospel does. It changes the way you see things. And so a lot of times people get really, really sensitive because it challenges the whole perspective on life. You guys with me? So understand you got to tread very carefully, tread very softly when, you, when I'm talking about things. And, I, and I'm going to try my best to, and, and I'm going to stay as hinged as possible. Okay? Okay. Joshua chapter 5, starting in verse 13. We're talking about how should I vote. It's coming up. I know we still got some time, but it'll be here before you know it. And I'm just going to give you guys some biblical principles Joshua chapter 5, starting verse 13, Lord, I ask you to just breathe on your word and let us see. Give us eyes to see. Give us the spirit of wisdom and understanding, God. Joshua chapter 5, starting in verse 13, it says, And it came to pass, when Joshua was by Jericho, that he lifted his eyes and looked, and behold, a man stood opposite with him, opposite him, excuse me, with his sword drawn in his hand. Everybody say a sword. Drawn in his hand, there was a man who stood opposite Joshua, and there was a sword drawn in his hand. You notice the, the H right there is capitalized. So what's the Bible implying? It's the Lord. Right? And Joshua went to him and said to him, are you for us or for our adversaries? I love the Lord's response. I'm going to just start saying this to people when they ask me a question. And he said, No. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, only God says stuff like that. So he said, no, but as commander of the army of the Lord, I have now come. And Joshua fell on his face to the earth and worshiped and said to him, what does my Lord say to his servant? That's, this is the heart posture. This is, if you want to know how to vote, we're reading it. Yeah. Then the commander of the Lord's army said to Joshua, take your sandal. Everybody say sandal. Notice he did not say sandals. He said sandal. Keegan. Sandal wearing brother. Take your sandal off your foot for the place where you stand is holy. And Joshua 
did so. My first thing I want to give you on how to vote is your allegiance is to Christ, not a political party. Your allegiance is to Christ. What it means to have allegiance is it means that you are subjecting yourself as a subordinate, is what they would call it, to somebody greater than you. That's what it means to swear your allegiance to somebody. But that's exactly what people do when they join up with a political party. So it's important that your allegiance first and foremost is to Jesus. Listen, every other party, every other governmental system, every other man-made system is in subjection to his sword. Yeah, that's what we just seen. The Lord's saying, you're for you, they're for them, but I'm for me. <laughs> that's what he said. You're for you, they're for them, but I'm for me. Join me if you, if you want to. And he's invited him. How you vote is just like that. I'm not for either one. I'm for the one that best represents the one that I'm about. Yeah? Yeah? I'm for the one that best represents the one I've sworn my allegiance to who's greater than this. The king of kings and the lord of lords. He is a governmental god. The government rests upon his shoulders. It is impossible to separate politics from the gospel, from Jesus. And here's why. Every political, this may be the most profound thing I say tonight, so listen. Every political system is formed off of moral principles, whether it's recognized or not. Every political system, every man-made system really is formed off of moral principles. So let me say it like this. What they think is right or wrong is what they're going to build their system on. I didn't mean for that to rhyme, but that was cool. Does that make sense? So if you're going to look at the gospel and look at the moral principles of the Lord, it's going to violate every man-made system. Do you see what I'm saying? And so you have to find the one that most closely represents this one. And so it's impossible to separate the two. Ultimately, my citizenship is in heaven. Listen, these man-made systems of government, they're passing away. The Bible says like this, the kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ. And he shall reign forever and ever. Amen. That's, that's my hope. I'm not. So this is another way you can say it. When my allegiance is in Christ, my hope isn't in the government to fix it. It can't. What we have, we don't just have two political parties in America. We have different moral opinions and moral subjections that are pitted against one another. You have this party saying this is what's right and this is what's wrong. And you have this other party saying this is what's right and this is what's wrong. And it's, it's the worst possible thing that could happen because here's what happens. And so then all the evil that happens in our nation, this party stands, points at that one and says, it's because of that party. And all the evil that's happened in our nation, this party stands and points at that one and says, it's because of that party. No, 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 no. It's because we've denied the right to the living God. It's because we've taken him out of school systems. We've taken him out of homes. Men of God no longer live like men of God. Come on, he violated the homes. If the homes fall, the entire structure, the entire integrity of a community crumbles. If men of God will not be men, men of God was made to be the pillars in their home that stand with the word of God consecrated and holy that says, we're going to pray. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And as soon as men of God begin to be moved from their rightful place, the integrity of our culture begin to crumble. Then feminism rises up. It's what happens. Did you know there was, there was a 15-year-old soccer team that beat the United States um, women's team during soccer like 7 to 1? Let me put it in basketball terms. If, if there was a basketball game, they're 15, they're playing like the best women that are supposed to be in the United States of America. They're 15 years old. Yeah, that's feminism. That's feminism is doing that. <laughs> it blows my mind. And it's really sad. Dude, this is, are you, dude, this is crazy. <clears throat> Women are different culturally about how they design who they are, how they express culture. They're, they're different that way. And they're different biologically. And our, our culture is trying to eliminate both of them. And so as feminism goes, we actually... 
we actually erase their influence over culture. And feminism is actually erasing the female role altogether by doing so. Does that make sense? I don't even know if I'm, if I'm making sense. And so I'm just saying it's just important. That, and I'm saying that none of that's this one's fault or none of them's the other person's fault. It's, it's, it's because the church of God it hasn't been the church of God. And it's supposed to happen. It's going to happen. We, we read about it. There's going to be, there's going to be a, you know, have anyone here been to a third world country? I've got to go a few times. This is just my observation. I've done, I've done zero research on what I'm about to tell you. Okay, there's that. <clears throat> this is my professional opinion. <clears throat> Do you know what a third, a third world country is? It's a country with no middle class. It really is. I've seen it. I've been there, and I, and I was looking, and either, and either, the, either they're they're wealthy living in the city, or it's it's not, and there's not there's no middle there. But that has to happen globally, and the middle class has to be completely removed from culture, for there to be an antichrist, either a system or a man. It didn't really don't matter to me to come and take control. There's no middle class to rebuttal that. Does that make sense? There can be no middle class to buffer that gap. So then, there, so then it's just setting this culture up for one person or one system to come up and take control of everything. Because they'll have all the resources and nobody else will. Does that make sense? So we know this has to happen. But it wasn't his design. See what I'm saying? Okay. Let's talk about Joshua when it comes to voting, how to vote. <clears throat> it's obviously a personal preference. Listen, it's obviously a personal preference. I'm not here to sway your preference. But listen, your preference comes from what you believe to be the most important. You prefer what you believe is most important. So it's important you know what you believe. Your preference comes from what you believe is most important. So it's important you know what you believe. Because you're going to prefer that. If, if you know it or not, that's what you're going to do. You'll have preference for those things. And so Joshua has entered the land of Canaan. They've been wandering around in the wilderness for 40 years. Moses dies. Joshua is the successor. He circumcises all the men of Israel. They're about to enter into the promised land. They've entered in. Joshua's there. You could say it like this. He's entered into a new political arena full of kings and warlords and territories and cities and governments. And so Joshua enters in as basically the governmental leader of the nation of Israel. And I imagine he's wondering, oh, Lord, what am I going to do? And he has an encounter with the Lord. And the Lord says, you're not choosing your system and you're not choosing yours. You're choosing mine. That's another way you can look at that story. And so I'm telling you tonight, family, choose his. Take your preferences out of it. Make your preferences his. And so he has this encounter and he he is with the Lord, and the Lord says, take, a, take your shoe off. So Joshua takes his shoe off. He's on his foot. Where else do you see that in the Bible that's significant? You see that in Ruth chapter 4, verse 7, actually. Boaz is going, and he's going to redeem his girl, Ruth. Right? Do we know the story? Ruth's walked through tremendous turmoil. She's, she's went back to her family. Her land has been sold, and, and they're trying to buy it back. Boaz is going to redeem her land. And in redeeming her land, he has to actually marry the woman that's attached to the land. That's how he redeems it. So what Boaz does is he finds the next closest relative to Ruth. You guys tracking with me? So Boaz finds the next closest relative to Ruth who would actually be the rightful heir of that land. So Boaz says, hey, closest relative to Ruth, do you want this land? The man says, yeah, that'd be cool. And he says, well, you get the girl too. And he says, wait, I can't do that. <laughs> He's scared of commitment. So Boaz says, all right, take your shoe off and give it to me. So the man took one of his shoe off, and I can't redeem this land, but you can. You hear what I'm saying? So Joshua takes his shoe off, basically saying to the Lord, Lord, I can't conquer this land, but you can. I can't redeem the land, Lord, but you can. It's significant. All this stuff has significance. And so that's just the heart posture. You have to, and so I said that to say this. Your heart posture, when it comes to voting and politics, it has to be soft and surrendered to the Lord. And know when people are freaking out, it's because the way they see life is being challenged. 
That's what all, I'm trying to tie all that together, okay. Does that make sense, you guys? Okay. See, every, everything else will fail us. Everything else stands at the mercy of his sword. So when it comes to how to vote, it's important our heart is clear in the sense we know that Jesus alone is the answer. Amen? Okay, so let's, let's go a little bit more. I want to give you the second thing um, about how to vote. Be knowledgeable about the party you vote for. Be knowledgeable about the party you vote for. I'm going to say it over here just to make sure we're getting it. Be knowledgeable about the party you vote for. Let me say it like this. The parties that are representing our country now are not the same parties that represented it 20 years ago. Okay? Be knowledgeable. So I did this quick search. This is verbatim. I didn't add anything to this. This is from the Britannica. The Britannica, Britannica, I think that's how you say it, <clears throat> which is uh, like a very, it's, it's used for like ac- lots of academia, lots of study. A lot of students got in there, post stuff. This is, this is verbatim. I typed, I just typed, what's the difference between the Republican Party and the Democratic Party? And I looked at it and I said, huh. And so I just typed out. So I'm just going to read it to you. This is exactly what it said. Democrats are generally considered liberal, while Republicans are seen as conservative. The Democratic Party typically supports a larger governmental role in economic issues, backing regulations, and social welfare programs. The Republicans, however, typically want a similar or a smaller government, excuse me, Republicans, however, typically want a smaller government that is less involved in the economy. This contrary view on the size of government is reflected in their positions on taxes. Democrats favor a progressive tax to finance government's expanded role, while Republicans support lower taxes for all. However, Republicans do support a large budget for the military, and they often aggressively pursue U.S. national security interests, even if that means acting unilaterally. That just means they don't care what anyone else thinks. Democrats, however, prefer multilateralism. On social issues, Democrats Democrats seek greater freedoms, while Republicans follow more traditional values. Supporting government intervention in such matters, for example, Democrats generally back abortion rights, while Republicans don't. In terms of geography, Democrats typically dominate large cities, while Republicans are especially popular, popular, as we know, in rural areas. That's what it said. I didn't add anything to that. That was right off... That was right off the website. That had no Joshology whatsoever. <clears throat> I want you to know, this is the last thing on how you should vote. You're not voting for a pastor. You're voting for a president. You're not voting for a pastor. You're voting for a president. And you're ultimately voting for a party that best overall supports the moral value systems of the scripture, the word of the living God. It's infallible. It's perfect. It's true. Testifies of God's sovereignty because men's tried to change it and destroy it for thousands of years and they failed every time, just representing God's grace. You find a party that best represents this and vote for that one. Amen? You're not voting for a, a pastor. You're voting for a president. You come here to hang out with your pastor. You go vote to elect your president. Okay? Everybody say, I'm going to say cool, cool. You all say sweet, sweet. Cool, cool? All right. So let's talk about the next thing. Why should I vote? Now, this is going to be extremely harsh, but I made it as graceful as I could. Okay, so if you don't vote, this will change your mind. It did mine. I started voting when I was, I'm 30 now, I voted when I was 26. This is the first time I got registered and I voted. <clears throat> so I'm, I'm going to repeat this because I believe it's worth repeating. Every political system, this is why you vote, every political system is established on moral principles. And these are guidelines to ensure people are doing the right thing. That's all they are. What they think is right and wrong. The policies that that political system makes is going to be determined by what they think is right or wrong. That's what their policies will determine. Right? A policy, if you don't know what a policy is, it's, it's a plan set in order to bring about change. That's what a policy is. And that's why I believe it's really important that politics are mentioned from the pulpit so people will know what's right or wrong, just in general. 
I've, I've been learning this just hanging out with my little friends. They have lots of energy. Most people don't know what in the world to do. Most people don't know what's right or what's wrong. And I truly believe in my heart. People are just looking for answers, man. People are just looking for something to help them. People walk around hurt and devastated and hopeless. They, and as, in general, I'm not speaking as everybody. If that's not you, it's not you. Like, cool, man, good for you. Like, love Jesus. That's great. That's what we want. But typically, that's not most people's reality. That's not most people's world. We have the answer, and it's Jesus. And, and listen, go to Matthew 23, and I want to read some scripture to you, just to staying in that train of thought. <clears throat> Matthew 23. I'll flip there too. I'll race you, Amy. Dang it. Matthew 23, we'll start in verse 29. Listen to this statement from Jesus. It, and I think it's, I think it's believe, I believe it's worth noting <clears throat> in what we're talking about. Are you guys okay? I know this isn't typical. I know I'm a pretty, I love you, Jesus, when you sit up here and get real ooey gooey with Jesus. That's right up my alley. That's what I love. That's what I do most. But man, this is important. This is the word of God. This is the future of your grandbabies and of your children. Yeah, I'm not, I'm not saying that to, to manipulate. I'm just saying that because it's true. Like That's the truth of the matter. And I'm going to show you here in Scripture of what I just said. So starting in verse 29 of Matthew chapter 23. Verse 29 of Matthew 23 says, Woe to you, scribes and Pharisees. He says, hypocrites. That means you say one thing, but you mean another. It's not you made a mistake and you call yourself a Christian and your heart's, and your heart's sorry. <clears throat> So he says, woe to you, scribes and Pharisees, hypocrites, because you build the tombs of the prophets and adorn the monuments of the righteous and say, if we had lived in the days of our fathers, we would not have been partakers with them in the blood of the prophets. Verse 31, Jesus goes on to say, therefore, you are witnesses against yourselves that you are sons of those who murdered the prophets. I'll just read 32. It says, fill up then the measure of your father's guilt. In essence, this is what Jesus is saying to them. You're a hypocrite because you're, you're celebrating the lives of these prophets, but your father killed those prophets. There's a prophet here, that actually the one who is the son of God, God in the flesh, and you want to kill him. He's saying, so you would have killed those men just like you want to kill me now. You would want to kill those prophets then just like you want to kill the son of man now. And he calls them out for it. So here's what we're seeing. We're seeing a repeated desire that's been handed down from generation to generation to generation. When moral, this is, this is how important mor morality is, moral principles are in a nation. This is why you should vote. This is why you should vote. He's, Jesus is saying that evil desire that was in your father to murder has been passed down and is now in you and you want to kill me. When... When that morality never changes because culture never changes, it'll be the same result over and over again, and it'll actually just steadily get worse. So now instead of just killing the prophets, they're killing God. Cool, cool? So it's important that you, that you vote. Listen, it, whenever you vote, you are casting your lot of agreement for what that party does. You're saying, I agree with what they're saying morally. That's what you're saying. When you vote, that's what you're doing. Jesus is saying, you're in agreement with those who murdered the prophets because you want to kill me. That's why you have to understand what you're doing. And you have to see your decisions today have generational consequences. I'll say it over here. Your, your decisions today... It has generational consequences. We just read about it. The Bible says that there is a spirit who works in the sons of disobedience. When morality declines, when nothing changes, when culture never changes, when, when that stuff just is handed down because we haven't actually spoke up and taken our rightful place. 
and morality decreases, it actually opens people's lives up to be in subjection to the enemy, to evil spirits. Let me show you. Go to Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 2. Ephesians chapter 2, I want you to turn. I want you to see this with me, of what I'm talking about. So as, as morality declines, and this is why it's so important you vote. This is why you vote according to the, the, the one that's closest morally that we could possibly get to. It's not perfect. I understand. There's only one who's perfect. His name is Jesus. But it's important that you vote because as, as morality declines, it actually opens people up for attacks of, of, the, of, of evil spirits. You can be a Christian and be influenced by a demon. You can't be possessed. When we hear possession, we hear ownership. That's not what really the word means in your Bible. That word possessed means influenced. And you can be influenced by an evil spirit. And are you guys okay, man? And so I, that's why it's so important. And as morality decreases, the more that subjection comes, especially to your children. That's what we just heard about Jesus. To be in subjection to those evil spirits. So now you have kids who think they're cats. They're not. They're, they're children. They're sons and daughters of God. You have little boys who, who think they're little girls. And little girls who think they're little boys. And what they're, what they're, what they're hearing is, is lies from the enemy. Because of the moral decline of our nation. And I'm going to be honest. Can I just shoot it straight? I mean, it's because we as the church have stood with our mouths shut. Because we have too many preachers that say we can't talk about politics. Don't ever, don't ever subject yourself to a sissy pastor. Don't ever do it. You need a man that stands up here in dirty cowboy boots sometimes and tells you that sin will send you to hell and the blood of Jesus will get you to heaven. You need it. And what we have is a, is a nation that wants their, their ears tickled. Yes. And we've heaped up for ourselves piles and piles of teachers and denominations. When someone goes somewhere, and I don't like that sermon, they go somewhere else. There's, there's no loyalty. There's no conviction. And since there's no conviction anymore, there's no real conversion. When's the last time you've laid on your face and wept because of your own sins and the sins of America? You with me? And, and it's, that's why it's important you vote because it, it, at least at some point in your heart, you can say, I'm trying to do everything that I know is possible to change the direction of this nation. That you can't one day, 20 years from now, look at your grandbabies in the face and see total chaos out in a world that's rejected God and know that you did everything you possibly could to show them Jesus. You don't want to look at them and think, I should have voted. I should have done more. When, you know, oh, Lord, I about just said something crazy. I'm going to say it. I'm just going to leave you. I'm just going to open up a can, and you go read. That's what I started doing, and my mind was like. Pfft. You start reading about Marxism and communism. You'll find yourself driving in a cul-de-sac. You'll see the Democratic Party's house, and right next to it, you'll see Karl Marx's house. That's all I'm going to say. I suggest turn around and drive out. Ephesians chapter 2, verses 1 through 2 says, And you he made alive, who were dead in trespasses and sins, in which you once walked according to the course of this world. Listen to this. This is the word of God, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit who now works in the sons of disobedience. There's a spirit who's working in the sons of disobedience. Our moral decisions actually open us up or close us up, so to speak. The Bible says a man who has no self-control is like a what? A city without what? Walls. It's the same principle. Okay. So, so your moral decisions open you up or close you up, so to speak, from attacks of the enemy. And we see here that the spirit, that's the spirit of the devil. When he says the prince of the power of the air, I'll tell you who that is. That's the devil. That's our adversary. The one who roams about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. That's him. 
Yeah? Am I, do I need to stop? Is this too much? Okay. And we see, we're seeing, we see it. We just read in scripture that this spirit of the devil actually influences those who continue to be disobedient. Let me give you another scripture. It's Timothy chapter 2, verse 24. I don't know. I didn't put it. <laughs> Timothy chapter 2. Let me go find it. Let me, let me jump to one. I think it's, yeah, I was about to say, I think it's second one. Yep, that's it. Second Timothy chapter 2. Listen to this. Now, this is how you live. In, in the day we're, we're, we're living in. Everybody there? Chapter 2 of 2 Timothy. We're going to start in verse 24. Let's just read this. I just, I just want us to see something. This is why it's so important that you vote. It says, And a servant of the Lord must not quarrel, but be gentle to all, able to teach, patient in humility, correcting those who are in opposition, if God perhaps will grant them repentance so that they may know the truth and that they may come to their senses and escape the snare of the devil. Come on, man. Having been taken captive by him to do what? His will. See that? You can jump back a little bit. <clears throat> Let's, let's go back to verse 20 while we're here. Let's just read this. Because he's, he's, he's talking about Christians. He's not talking to the world. He says, but in a great house. So he's implying, he's implying the church, a great house. There are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay. Listen to what he says. Some for honor and some for dishonor. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from the latter, he'll be a vessel for honor sanctified and useful for the master, prepared for every good work, fleeing useful lusts, but pursuing righteousness, faith, love, peace with those who call on the Lord out of a pure heart. But avoid foolish and ignorant disputes, knowing that they generate strife. That's what he says before that. He's, he's, talking, he's talking to us, man. You guys see that? It's a big deal. So let me answer this last question. Is it wrong to vote? I, I've, I've had that question. And, and this is really what people are asking. This is really the question. If we are to only trust in Jesus and, and he alone is our source, is voting for a political party or a political agenda violating our trust in Jesus? That's an honest, I mean, that's a good question. That's the, when people ask, is it wrong to vote? That's what they're asking. It's a good question. Psalms, besides what we just said, what we just talked about, you could, you could say that too, but I just I want to give us this in, in the sense of, is it wrong to vote? Go to Psalms 115, verse 16. I'm working, I'm working you out in your Bible tonight. Psalms 115, verse 16. <clears throat> I'm going to read this, and then we'll, we'll pray and be done. Talk about this for a second. Psalms 115, verse 16 says, The heavens, the heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's. But the earth he has given to the children of men. The heaven, even the heavens are the Lord's. But the earth he has given to the children of men. Listen, a steward, you hear that word in your Bible, you need to know what it is. A steward is someone who manages or takes care of something that belongs to someone else. Things like resources, time, talent, are all things that God has given us to be good stewards of. And I believe, I truly believe this in my heart. This is a conviction in my heart. Being a poor steward of our nation, if we don't vote for what we truly believe to be best. I believe that in my heart. 
Listen, this is when voting is wrong. Voting can be wrong. It's not wrong, but it can be. Jesus tells us to beware of the leaven of the Pharisees. Beware of the leaven of the Sadducees. And beware of the leaven of, anyone remember the last one? Of Herod. The first one's hypocrisy. Really, the first and second one's kind of religion and hypocrisy. But the third one, Herod was a, re- a religious leader. Or not a religious leader, excuse me, a political leader and a mighty one. When you hear King Herod in your Bible, he, you can still, if you go to Israel today, you still see the imprint that King Herod had in his time, 2,000 years later. When the Bible actually says <clears throat> he was probably one of the greatest architects of his time. He was one of the first men to build a port. His house had a swimming pool in it. They had plumbing. It was amazing. King Herod did. He, he was a great, great architect. When they, when they actually are they're walking into the temple, and they look at Jesus, and they say, hey, Jesus, you see what manner of stones these are. Remember that scripture? That's because King Herod actually, in his architectural mind, had made the stones look decorative. He was a mighty, mighty man. But Jesus says to beware of this leaven. And that leaven is, is a political leaven. Because, man, if, if your heart's not pure and it's not surrendered one to Jesus, you'll become argumentative. You will debate. You, you don't have to debate. You, do you hear me? You don't have to debate. Man, people try to debate with me. I just smile, and I'm like, this is going to produce zero life. It's going to go nowhere. You're just going to get razzled up, man. There's no point in it. <clears throat> but voting becomes wrong when the leaven of Herod gets in your heart. That's, that's when you actually, you'll actually do more harm as your witness for Jesus than you will good. You'll say things out of character. You'll act out of character. Leaven, listen to me. You know what leaven does? It, it is unseen influence. Everybody say it with me. Leaven is unseen influence. That's what leaven is. So that political leaven wants to get in your heart and influence how you communicate, how you see people, how you look at the opposing parties. That's when voting is wrong. That's when... You need to get your heart before the Lord and soften your heart. That's not right. If you want to put the blame on anybody, there's only two people. People I wouldn't even like. People I wouldn't even like me saying this. One is the devil. The next one's you. <laughs> I, I'm serious. Come on. You got to deal with yourself. Jesus says, how could you ever go up to your brother with a plank in your eye and he's got a speck in his? You're like, hey, brother. You need to get that out of your life. Get it out of your life, sinner. But he says, but if you remove the plank out of your eye, you know what he says next? You'll see clearly to be able to go up to your brother and remove the speck from his. How you handle a plank and how you handle a speck is entirely two different things. Amen? You guys okay? Okay, will you guys stand with me? Let's bless the Lord. <clears throat> Man, God, God's going to take care of his church. Listen, Pastor Ani would be okay with me saying this. You know there's only one person necessary in this house, and his name's Holy Ghost. And I just, I just feel in my heart, man, just this, just this zeal almost. <clears throat> He, just, he says, actually, zeal for your house has eaten me up. There's like this zeal just that's been in, my, in me. I've been almost like carrying this, this burden of, oh, God, we need you. That's, all, that's the only answer. All I know to do is take my shoe off <laughs> and hand it to Jesus and say, I can't redeem this land you can. I can't bring revival to America, but you can. I can't bring change to my community, but you can. I can't swear my allegiance to anyone else but you. 
And so tonight, I just I want us to do that just in your heart to say, Jesus, you're the only one. You're the commander of the Lord of hosts. You're the, you're the God of heaven's armies. You, the government, rest upon your shoulders. All my hope, all my expectation is in you. My expectation isn't in man and his abilities. My expectation is in the Lord and him alone. God, all my hope is in you, God. I thank you, Father. I just pray that just as even as, as they just celebrated Passover, they would take all the leaven, they would throw it out of their house. And so if there's any leaven in my heart of religion, any leaven of pride, any leaven of hypocrisy, any leaven of politics, God, I just pray now we just throw it out. Just throw it out of your heart right now in the name of Jesus. God, all we want is you. I don't want anything to influence me but the Holy Spirit, God. And so, Father, I thank you that tonight our hearts are before you, God. Our hearts are before you, God, and we're asking for mercy on our nation. We're asking for wisdom, the spirit of wisdom and revelation to come upon your people, God, as we're living in these times and we're living in these days. I even just even hear the scripture. In the last days, the Bible says, and there'll be perilous times and there'll be men will be lovers of themselves and there'll be, there'll be haters of what is good and haters of authority, God. And so I pray that as we're living in these times, these perilous times, you would give us wisdom. You give us entrance into people's hearts, God. And I thank you, Father, that we're as truly a city set on a hill, God. And I pray that we would prepare ourselves like a bride for her groom, Lord. And I thank you you're coming back for a holy bride. Lord, and I just pray right now by the Spirit of God, we would set ourselves apart for you and you alone. For you and you alone. Everybody say it with me. For you and you alone. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You guys go forth. Be blessed. I believe the food pantry is going to be open tonight. I love you guys. Is it 6.30 or 7? 6? I have, I have plans. There's a prayer service tomorrow at the park at 6. 6 for the community of Pea Ridge. And so um, if you want to go to that, that would be cool. I love you guys. Be blessed.